you have done a lot of research into serotonin 2A receptors. Um, could you explain why is it so important that we understand how these receptors work? Well, um, the um, serotonin system is uh, a really abundant uh, system that influences uh, many, many different psychophysiological functions. And um, the 5-HT2A receptor, which we have done much work on in my group, um, is particularly intriguing. It is the most abundant serotonin receptor in the brain. Uh, and it is also the target of uh, classical psychedelics such as uh, MSD, psilocybin, and DMT, et cetera. So uh, understanding its functions uh, is really intriguing and its effects, of course, also um, with the psychedelic effects uh, is, is also very important to understand uh, the actions of psychedelics on that receptor. So what can you tell me about how psilocybin uh, specifically interacts with these receptors? What did you find out? So, so psilocybin uh, is not the active, the real active component. It is the uh, metabolites called psilocin. And uh, once you have had uh, the intake of psilocybin, it converts in the blood into psilocin. Psilocin crosses the blood-brain barrier by the bloodstream where it interacts uh, with the serotonin 2A receptors, which are also called 5-HT2A receptors. And um, in doing so, uh, it elicits uh, the um, psychedelic effects that are so well known. So what we've seen uh, in our studies, uh, among other things, is that when we compare the concentration of psilocin in the blood to the occupancy of psilocin in the brain, and to uh, the psychedelic effects, we can see that there's a very nice correlation between the three of them. So by measuring the concentration in the blood, we can tell approximately what is the occupancy at the receptor site in the brain. And we can also tell uh, how strong are the psychedelic effects. Um, so this is uh, a nice tool to actually be able to objectively tell uh, about the effects in the brain just by measuring uh, the, the concentration in the blood. So what we are interested in doing now is to tell to what extent does the same thing happen with other psychedelic compounds such as LSD or DMT. So, uh, so that, is, um, that is some work in progress. We have also uh, looked at many other things. We have related uh, the effects of psychedelics on a long-term basis to what happens in the regulation. And it seems that uh, the long-term effects of psychedelics, of psilocybin in particular, um, is that the moment that you have had a psychedelic experience, the 5-HT2A receptors start to downregulate. And the extent to which they downregulate is associated with the long-term effects on positive mood and, um, and what we uh, think of as, um, uh, I would say, more mindfulness and spirituality uh, as measured three months later. So this is one of the intriguing things uh, with psychedelics is that how come that just one single exposure to the drug can actually have such long lasting effects. It's really interesting because you're you're bridging that gap sort of between the individual experience and, and what maybe the mind says and what actually happens in the body and you can quantify it um, quite specifically. What, what, what has it taught you about dosing in general? Well, um, it has taught us um, the relationship between dosing, which also is related to the brain occupancy. So you can actually titrate uh, the doses and get different occupancies. And depending on what occupancy you have, you will also have uh, different um, experiences. Now, one thing that is quite intriguing and that we and others are very interested to learn more about is to what extent does the qualitative content of the psychedelic experience matter in the long run. Now, I think it's uh, most likely in order to explain this biologically, um, to understand whether you have some really profound experiences of unity uh, with the world and mystical experiences as we call them, 
then it, it seems from many other studies, it seems that the extent to which you have this profound feeling of mystical experience is also related to how uh, the long-term effects pan out. And if we want to explain that uh, biologically, um, it makes sense because we know that things the brain experience does shape it in the future. Uh, and most likely this is done through some epigenetic mechanisms. That's how I think about it. Uh, some maybe lasting neuroplastic effects. Uh, and um, it's these new plastic effects that, uh, that we're trying also to capture and to measure um, in a biological manner. Yeah. Did you find any um, activity base of these serotonin receptors uh, outside the mind? Um, sorry, outside the, the 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 brain, I should say. And um, I, I think there's a very often there's a there's a layman discussion between mind and body, so to speak. But serotonin receptors, if I'm not mistaken, are all over your body. Well, yes, you can have uh, the the serotonin is a very um, a very dominant uh, neurotransmitter, particularly in in the gut. Um, there are many many receptors there, but there are also uh, receptors other places uh, in the body. Um, but you know, I think this distinction between mm, mind and body. Uh, we are our brains, and what happens in our brains is what shapes us as people. So I don't think we need to look outside the brain to identify, you know, mechanisms whereby uh, psychedelics have these long-lasting effects. Uh -huh. that, that seems to not, that, not have that it, same influence it has in the brain. It doesn't seem to um, show big, big effects elsewhere in the body or doesn't, doesn't seem relevant. I think. I think it does have effects uh, beyond um, the brain, but um, but it it's not something that is very prevalent, uh, and people do not you know need to think much about it. You can have some bodily sensations, obviously, uh, when you take the drug, but that is uh, completely understandable and explained by the brain mechanisms. What will be your uh, topic at ICPR? Do you uh, do you already know? And and ICPR, I'll be talking about these stunning effects that this just exposure to one or a few single doses of psychedelics uh, is actually able to shape your mind on a long-term basis because this is really, really unique uh, for a, a drug. Uh, and, and I cannot really think of many other drugs where that is the case. So what we and others are trying to understand now is how can we measure these effects and, and what kind of research do we need to do in order to get a better understanding of these long-term effects? Is it really new plasticity? Uh, is it through some other mechanism? Uh, and, and what it really boils down to is what kind of technologies do we have available today whereby we can measure the brain uh, and the effects on the brain of such compounds. That is going to be the topic at the ICPR. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, so especially because we don't we don't know so much. Is it is is there a way we can also then develop better drugs if or or more specific types of drugs? Is that also part of the that, scope? That is there's a lot of work going on, um, particularly in the U.S. but also in Europe where um, individual scientists and companies are looking to see if they can generate uh, ways to stimulate the serotonin 2A receptor, but without the psychedelic effects. Uh, because obviously giving psychedelic drugs to people is something where you need to be a little careful uh, as a clinician, uh, but also as a scientist. So for instance, we would always screen our our, uh, in the individuals that um, we give psychedelics, we'll always screen them to make sure that they do not have any psychotic potential um, because uh, some of uh, the unfortunate side effects can be that people experience anxiety. Uh, and, and, and that is of course a very unfortunate thing. Plus the entire session takes time uh, it takes time to bring people in, to explain them about the psychedelic experience that they're about to have, to prepare them in a proper manner. And during the trip, there needs to be people, experienced people who sit with them, make sure that they are comfortable, 
they feel fine. And if anything should occur that they're there to help them, bring them further on. And also, we also spend much time with people afterwards talking through their experience and, and having them, you know, kind of digest the whole experience in order to make sure that it's a very safe procedure. Uh, so obviously, if one could get some of the um, mood effects, some of the beneficial effects uh, without the psychedelic experience would from a kind of pharmacological point of view would be preferential. Uh, whether that is possible uh, or whether you actually need to have a profound experience, uh, that's a different story. Is it is it true, in, do you think that all this research needs to happen first before we will see psychedelics in a more general setting, so to speak, outside of, outside of scientific trials? No, I think there is a real uh, possibility that um, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. will approve uh, psilocybin uh, for a treatment-resistant depression uh, in the not too long future. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can you should stop the research. Of course not. You will, it will keep on going. And uh, but but it has uh, proven to be, uh, I think, at least for certain people for certain patients it has proven to be helpful and with a quite rapid onset as well i should add because some of the more traditional antidepressive drugs take longer to work could take weeks before they work yeah thank you so much a really really great conversation thank you it's enlightening for me as well uh, and looking forward to your talk also I'll see you. yeah and looking forward to seeing you uh, next month at ispr okay yeah. see you then bye, bye.